There we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so first, I want to uh, thank uh, thank Galvanize and Data by the Bay, Alexi, for having us uh, here to talk about this. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're, we're dubbing it like to vec. Uh, suggestively, it's a new technique for uh, recommender algorithms. This is a project that has come out of the capstones um, that Galvanize held with uh, with SkyMine, the uh, the the company for uh, DL4J. Um, I have I'm Mike Demir. I'm formerly chief science officer for Galvanize and now chief data scientist for Intertrust. And uh, I have with me uh, Marvin and David, uh, two of our graduate students from Galvanize. So. With that, let's get started. All right, so quick run through the agenda. We are going to just do a little bit of recap in the first two acts. Uh, matrix factorization as compression, talking about stacked autoencoders in order to motivate uh, what led us to this idea for, um, for like to vec. And then we will go into shallow neural, uh, neural word embeddings, uh, talk a little bit about word to vec and what that is for those of us uh, that who are not as familiar with that. And then move on to the, uh, the main results, uh, like to vec an application of uh, word to vec type strategies, but for recommender engines. And we will uh, go over some of the results, and, uh, and, and Marvin will help us with that. All right, so let's start just with a quick review of matrix factorization thought of as compression. So uh, this is a, a story, an old story, of how do you do, say you want to do uh, text classification on your documents you have suite of documents, document one through document n, and you count up the terms. Those terms are kind of the frequent, or the term frequencies are kind of the properties of each document. We're not worrying about structure right now. Um, so you get this term frequency matrix, and you know, documents go that way, terms go that way. It's very large. Your vocabulary, so your dimensionality of, the, uh, of, of this space in which you're representing your documents is on the order of 100,000, likely a million different terms. It's the size of your whole vocabulary. So we should be the thinking Curse of dimensionality, sparsity, and indeed, most of those terms are going to be very sparse. Uh, or sorry, m most, most of the data is going to be empty. There's going to be a lot of, most of those rows are going to be sparse in that representation. When we, um, so the problems with uh, document uh, text frequency representation is, so we have high dimensionality, we have sparse representation, then we also have this thing uh, which is more passive term instantiation. And passive term instantiation, you, you might have chosen to use the word slacks instead of pants. And there are some subtleties between these two words, but um, be, th there's not that much subtlety. And, and in, in this representation, they are on completely different axes. They're represented in completely different columns, and so that puts more onus on your, uh, your machine learning to figure out the similarity on that and to combine that signal, which likely have a uh, shared signal in a lot of contexts for a lot of use cases. What's the solution? Well, we can use uh, matrix factorization in order to find the latent topic space. How does that work? We have our documents terms matrix, and then we use something like uh, um, you know, ALS or NMF algorithm using an ALS to, uh, to, to choose how to actually uh, do gradient descent on that algorithm. And we, we factor it into a, uh, a, a skinny but tall matrix and a short but wide matrix. Actually, that's uh, skinny but tall too, but you take the transpose when you're factoring. And you have a representation of every document in your uh, document term matrix in terms of these latent factors. You can choose the dimensions, the k dimensions that you want. And you have a representation of every term in terms of those k dimensions. So um, if you're, if you're uh, Depending on how those different latent terms are represented, you will have a different representation of the document, and that document can be translated into the representation in the terms. And you can make, you can multiply uh, matrix multiply these two um, these two matrices back and fill in the fill in the entire blue square, the term the document term uh, frequency square, and you can get different representations in terms of those latent factors. Or sorry, those latent topics. Something with uh, we see this same this same results when we do uh, user item matrix and we do matrix factorization for user item matrix in recommenders. So uh, again, you have high dimensionality. Again, you have sparse representation. Even if you are the most um, the, the 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 most um, average user of, of Netflix, you, you, you probably aren't going to watch all the movies. You probably aren't going to buy every item in, on, in the Amazon inventory. And so there's going to be a very sparse representation for every user. Um, and there's, uh, there's also one class 
uh, one class representation. Just because you didn't buy a product yet doesn't mean it's not a product that you want to buy. In fact, a recommender that only uh, recommends products that you've already bought is going to be a pretty crappy recommender. And uh, so um, this is this is called one class uh, classification, one class representation, and it's going to be when you're doing working with implicit purchase data, it's going to be similar to that uh, passive term instantiation. Solution, matrix factorization. Again, you have your users, you have your latent factors, you, uh, you factor it using you know, latest and greatest, you know, something like NMF with ALS or, or more advanced versions of that, and you can represent each user in terms of their latent features, things like uh, interested in sci-fi, interested in action adventure, inter interested in romantic comedies, which by this algorithm will tend to, um, to bubble up as columns uh, w when you look at the, uh, at the factorization. So why am I bringing this up? One way to think about what's going on when you do this factorization is what you're doing is you're, you're actually compressing the information. You're taking uh, the, the, big, uh, the big insight to collaborative filtering and matrix factorization is that um, you know, users can be represented in terms of the things they buy. Uh, problem is cursive dimensionality, so we have to compress that high dimensional representation into a dense, rich, low dimensional representation. That's what matrix factors is doing. The low dimensional, low dimensional representation is the, uh, the latent feature space. All right, so that's one example. That's a linear example, or an example of a linear mapping for um, compressing the high dimensional signal into a lower dimensional signal. Let's talk about another one, just for contrast, that's, that's nonlinear, it's stacked autoencoders. This is a, one of the first breakthroughs in, um, in, in deep, arbitrary deep uh, learning uh, neural nets. Um, so this is a non-stacked autoencoder, this is just one autoencoder. The way it works is you have your input data, your X data, um, you map it down with a matrix W that, that is, is um, you know, shorter than it is wide. So it takes a long X vector and produces a shorter Y vector. And then you undo that um, you, 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 to get a Z vector, and then you compare the difference between the input vector and the output vector. And the idea in, in autoencoding is that you want to minimize um, the loss, the information loss, by squeezing it through that keyhole in the middle. Uh, and and you, you can pick your own loss function. And what you do is you, you actually train based on that loss. You do your gradient, uh, your gradient descent on that loss. Um, and then you can repeat. So you clamp the ends, um, and then you do another level of, of autoencoding. And so you can continue this um, odd infimitum to uh, 2n plus 1 different layers. And what you're doing is you're compressing by orders of magnitude the input vector down to that uh, middle y, um, y, y uh, nodes, uh, and what that does is that actually compresses the information. It compresses the information. It can be effective in a lot of different contexts. Uh, turns out that it's uh, well, um, and then once you once you do the compression, you can add your favorite classifier at the end. Often it's uh, you know you do some uh, some some fine tuning uh, by a supervised backprop, and you get your answer whatever it is with that compressed representation, that Y two representation in this case. Um, it doesn't work as well as you would like for text or for items. Um, first of all, why? Uh, it, well, it's fundamentally unsupervised. What it's, what it's doing is it's saying, I want to preserve the information, but I don't care how I preserve it. I just want to preserve it. And, um, and it does that, it does that with um, non-illuminating and non-linear transformations. At each node, uh, each layer in the neural net, it's, uh, it's, doing an, uh, it's adding a layer of nonlinearity. And what that does is um, it, it seems to, or it suggests that what that does is it actually um, eliminates some of the important structure that we want to keep that is represented in our, in our language, at least in this case, in uh, the co-occurrences the co of different terms. It doesn't um, help as much as we would like because um, you know, something about moving the, or adding those nonlinearities in our compression um, actually obfuscates the signal. It doesn't preserve the signal or, or make it even easier to detect. All right, so, um, so that's kind of like the, the gun in Act 2. Um, you know, Nonlinearities can hurt. Maybe we should use linearities. And um, so we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about word to vec word to vec has, uh, it was developed over a series of papers, and it's really revolutionized how we work with text. 
uh, this now in 2016. It, um, it is a uh, simple uh, continuous vector representation for individual terms. So it's um, just a quick, a quick, I'm gonna go through the algorithm, but a quick uh, review of the highlights. Um, so it's, uh, it's trained to specialize in sentence context completion. So, uh, so you have a simple neural net of three layers and it's um, trained the way the, that that compression is trained actually is for uh, sentence completion, like continuous back of words, et cetera. Um, it seems like what it's doing is it's actually um, capturing information about co-occurrence or um, you know, this uh, recent results suggest that it's actually capturing information specifically about mutual information, point-wise mutual information between the terms. Um, and then uh, it encodes conceptual relationships and we'll give a very um, well-trodden example of that in a moment, so what I mean by that. Okay, so I'm, I am going to explain the algorithm real quick because it's important to understanding the next stage, which is how we use the, uh, this sort of, or this style of algorithm. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> this style of algorithm for, for like to <laughs> um, Okay, so, so real quick, we have our, um, what, what we do is we we're con pretend we're trying to do a, a sentence completion, an n-gram um, algorithm where we have uh, the cat on the, guess the next word. So we take those words and we project them, uh, we give the projection, the indicator vector, which basically is as long as our vocabulary, say a million dimensions long. And uh, it's all zeros except for a one for, um, for whichever word represents that specific dimension. So if we have all our vocabulary alphabetically, then A is, the fir is one and all zeros and so forth. And is, yeah, and is, uh, is, is, oh, is a two and all zeros? Oh. Yep. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so the, we, we project that for several words, the cat on the, and that's the context of the term. And then we, uh, then, then we send that through um, into the projection layer. We map that with a linear mapping. W is just a matrix. So it's a matrix that is, in this case, say if we have a million dimensional uh, um, vocabulary, then it's three million wide. Um, so we have a three million long matrix to, if we want to project down into, say, a 300 dimensional uh, vector space by 300 dimensions. And um, that's how we get to this H layer, this hidden layer. Then you do your nonlinearity with activation function of your choice. And and you map into, um, into, pr into predicting the most likely word, you add a probability assignment to each of those words with something like a you know, max ant or um, you choose your poison. And so the word that is gets the highest probability of coming next is um, then trained and cross-referenced by, the, um, by the training data, by the label data, um, compared to the word mat. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. Um, I use the um, yeah, so this isn't our algorithm. This is the word vec algorithm, but but yeah, backprop is or um, you know backprop with uh, with other op optimizations would be the way that you would you would train this. And and the parameters, remember the parameters here are the um, the W matrix, the the entries into that uh, millions by hundreds uh, matrix. And then uh, and I'm skipping a lot of details here. I'm just trying to get us the gestalt of what it is. Um, then you would you know that that you have a matrix that's three million. Um, actually, you want a matrix that's one million if your vocabulary is one million by three hundred. So you would. Uh, you, 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 would, you would find a way of aggregating each of those three projections that, each, that represent each of the context terms. Um, and you would probably do multiple passes with multiple ends. So there's a lot of details here that we're skipping. Uh, but the general idea is that you feed it in here, you project it down linearly, you do a nonlinear non activation, and then you use that to project the next word. Or continuous bag of words is another common task. And, the cool thing here is that the, the, the word to vec matrix is almost like a pleasant side effect that's incredibly valuable from just training it to do this task. And the pleasant side effect is that now we have a method of mapping every single term based only on, say, its position in the vocabulary. It's the nth word in our list of words, in our vocabulary of words. And um, it actually captures the semantics. And so this is uh, one of the most popular examples of that. You have your uh, king, uh, your king vector, your queen vector, your woman vector, your man vector, you find the difference between the uh, woman and the man vector, and, um, and then you add that vector to the king vector, and 
lo and behold, you end up being epsilon close to the queen vector, which is a very cool, um, cool thing and, and, and suggests that, um, that Wurtevec actually captures something about the semantics of the terms in compressing. It doesn't just map to smaller number of dimensions, it also captures something about the meaning. The geometry in that representation is, is semantically significant. Um, Okay, so, and that also means, and this is an important point for something we're gonna be talking about later, um, direction matters too. There is a femininity direction, uh, or there's a, maybe a higher status quote uh, direction that is also captured in the representation in this vector space. So you can use this also to, um, to represent documents, for instance. Um, so uh, you, you take your documents, you might remove the stop words, you find the, um, the, the aggregate of those words, and now you have a way of representing the entire document in terms of the instances of the words themselves. Um, and you can do this both in a supervised context or an unsupervised context. Now you've, uh, you've uh, what I've just done is, is shown a way with naive Doctovec, uh, if you take the average or the L2 one norm, or L2 or L1 norm of this vector, um, you have a direction of the document, and that direction of the document um, has other words that are also embedded in that very same word to vec space. And so you can do unsupervised um, text classification, you can do supervised text classification, there's all sorts of different uh, ways that you can really take advantage of this representation. All right, so I do want to um, move on because I want to make sure that we have enough time for the, for the juicy stuff. Um, there is, just as a, as a uh, aside for questions, um, there are more advanced versions than just uh, naive Dr. Vec. We can talk about that in question and answer if we want. All right, let's talk about like to vec. So um, like to vec, what we want to do is we have our user item representation, the, the items that every person watched or read or listened to or purchased, and we want to figure out a way to semantically embed that, semantically is with quotes, um, into the vector space, into a lower dimensional vector space in a way that captures the significance of these purchase patterns or watch patterns. Um, so let's reflect on what, what I very quickly went through. Number one, it's fundamentally linear um, in the case of, 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 of representing words, and also suggest, it's suggested that it's fundamentally linear, um, at least in co-frequency, co-purchasing, for uh, purchase patterns. That's part of the reason why, um, why maybe matrix factorization uh, works so well. This is just a suggestion. Uh, it's suggested by the evidence. It's not, um, it's, it's not something that, that is definitely true, and there are certainly other um, nonlinear uh, you know, ways that we can use deep learning for, um, uh, for, for text and for items, but in this, uh, in this specific context, it seems like it's fundamentally linear. Um, it's reconstruction uh, co-occurrences, uh, and the underlying model is actually um, the mutual in information graph. So what do I mean by that? Um, with the word to vec, what we're doing is we're taking documents, which are these, um, th these it's, it's a random variable or a string of events that represent conditional random variables, or random variables conditional on the uh, result of the last the, the last term, um, the last random variable outcome. And what happens there is that, um, you know, the, we can, you can kind of think about that in terms of a graph structure where um, each word is a node. And what you're doing is you're randomly walking from one node to the next, and there's a probability of going from one node to the next. And you can actually weight those probabilities um, by the mutual information of term to term in the graph. And so, um, one thing that the deep walk algorithm does, this was done by uh, Perosi and, and his team over in Stony Brook, is took that one step further. Instead of just restricting it to the, um, the representation of co-occurrences of words as a string of random variables um, based on an underlying model, like a graph model, um, and then treating each document as an instantiation of a pull from that graph model, uh, they just went straight from the graph model. So they take an arbitrary graph, um, bidirectional, they uh, treat words as node, and, and here for the for the deep walk, words aren't actually don't ac actually need to be words. They can be anything, but um, they they um, each node represents something like a quote word in generating these strings. And as it randomly walks, we create a quote gra a, a, qu a quote document, which is just a string of t steps randomly walking this graph. So we could do this with words and with actual documents. We could do this with any graphical model that's symmetric. And then everything's the same. And you still run it through the, um, the say, the, 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 like, the word to vec 
um, three layer shallow neural net. Um, you could do continuous back words, skip gram, or you, you, could, you, or you make modifications as appropriate. And what you end up is a, well, end up with is an embedding of the graph structure in a much, much lower dimensional representation. So you get, um, you, so you input a sparse graph and you get a mapping of the nodes in that graph into a, say, two dimensional space in this toy example. All right. So let's talk about, um, go back to the recommender case, right? The recommender case, we also have sparsity issues just like in text. So the natural inference that drove what we did here was thinking about that sparsity. And um, you could use code, you, you know, the, the user item matrix is not a symmetric matrix, but if you take the covariance matrix of these, so you, you multiply by the transpose, you could get a symmetric matrix that's item by item. You could even get a symmetric matrix that's user by user. Typically, the user by user, uh, user, user base, if your company's doing well, is gonna be way too big to deal with it, way too many dimensions, even more than the number of items that you have. But if we could compress it somehow, we might be able to take deep advantage of that user symmetric matrix. Um, you don't have to use covariance. You could use other cases like mutual information, uh, log likelihood ratio, which also scales with mutual information. Um, and in our specific uh, results that we're talking about today, we're, we used log likelihood ratio. Um, so log likelihood ratio uh, does a couple things. It is the ratio of the likelihoods of two models. It, um, it computes a score that analyzes the uh, counts of the events as they occur together. It tells you how many times more likely the two items are to co-occur as, uh, as not. So it, it, um, it, it, it is a measure of the uh, probability distribution in the sense of uh, randomly pulling from, um, from different, say, uh, purchases as a distribution over um, over the different items in this case, and it um, it does something. You know, it, it, there's a log in there, and uh, much like when we do TF-IDF, that helps to control for uh, commonly occurring items or commonly occurring words. Uh, in this case, commonly occurring items. So it solves um, what, what the uh, the quote banana problem that you might remember from uh, from uh, market basket analysis. Everybody buys bananas. So if you don't conditionalize, you end up recommending bananas to every purchase, every basket. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about the like to vec recipe. The like to vec recipe um, is uh, fairly straightforward. You take your, 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 your symmetric matrix, uh, that symmetric matrix could be uh, represented in any of the similarities of item item, user user. Um, then you leverage that density um, so you can look at, uh, for instance, embed, uh, embed the users, look at the other users that are close to that user in the dense representation space, the uh, like to vec uh, uh, mapping space, and, um, and, and then you can, uh, for instance, see uh, what other, per what other um, ratings did they give for, for a movie or an item that you, uh, that, that you want to predict a rating for for this individual user. And because they're so, so close in this representation space, you can get a, uh, a good sense of what, they, what the actual user in proximity to all these other users would assign for that particular space or what they might purchase, et cetera. Um, and then you can do this not just for embedding the users, you could also do it for the items. Now, saying this about the items doesn't, isn't as intuitive, but for a given item, you could look at the other items that are similar to that. And if you think of, say, star ratings or being purchased by as the relation with users now, um, then you can uh, start to, uh, then, then you can start to fill in what, the, um, what a particular user would, write, would rank that item as. All right, and now for the results, which, uh, Marvin will talk about some of these results, which are very cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about some of the preliminary results we have so far, and um, some of the, some of the ap new approaches we've been taking with the uh, like to vec um, so for any uh, machine learning algorithm, it's very crucial to pick the right evaluation metric that is in line with the task you, you're, you're gonna perform in, uh, in the field. And so for recommend the system, uh, the most widely used metric is actually RMSC, the root mean squared error. Um, and it turns out that this is actually not a natural fit for evaluating tasks that try to optimize the top end recommendations. Just minimizing RMSC doesn't necessarily uh, translate into accuracy improvements. Um, what RMSC does, it, it captures the average error between the true rating and your predicted rating. 
And so what, what's wrong here? In practice, when you're actually recommending movies, you really only care about the best matches, the most relevant, the most valuable item you, or movies you want to recommend to that user. And so those items are the ones that are going to be rated five stars, maybe four stars, but not lower. Uh, so for example, does it really matter if you predict a rating of 1.2 and the true rating is one? Then do you really want to optimize that? It's never going to be, this movie is never going to be used in your recommendation. So with IMSC, you waste way too much training time trying to optimize to correctly predict ratings for items that you're never going to be, you're never going to use. They're irrelevant for that specific user. So we actually need an evaluation metric that only concentrate on highly relevant, highly viable um, movies and only uh, optimize and recommend on those movies. And so what we use is a metric that's called record at N. And so it's based on, on ideas we have with accuracy, record, and precision. Those are well-known metrics that is used uh, in uh, machine learning classification algorithms. So we take the same intuition here and we factor the, the scores into um, something that can work with recommender systems. So in a nutshell, the idea is to take your test set and only keep your highly rated movies, the movies that are rated five stars. And so here, the assumption here is that in your test set, you're only going to have highly re relevant, highly viable movies that you're going to try to force your recommender to predict to that specific user. And for each of those highly rated movies, you're going to pick a thousand random movies that the user hasn't seen yet. And so here, the idea is that those random movies are going to be, on average, of less interest to that user. Of course, within that thousand, there are probably going to be a couple of movies that are, in fact, pretty relevant and pretty good recommendation for that user. So it's good to keep in mind that record N gives you a measure of recall, but that is a lower bound to what you actually will find in practice when you actually use the recommender system. So you take those 1,001 movies that you bundle together, and then you feed that through your recommender system, and you try to rank them and retrieve as, as best as possible your test set data. And you do that by computing some kind of similarity between that movie. So just to backtrack a little bit, we started with a high dimensional graph that represents the interaction between your movies. And we take that high dimensional sparse data and we squeeze it through the like to vec algorithm to represent it into a dense representation of rich latent features. And with those features, we can perform operations in the same way we perform the operation with like to vec What we do here is for similarity, we do a cosine similarity, which is a simple dot product between one vector to the other. So what, is a dot, what, is a, what does it represent a dot product? It's a projection of one vector along all of its dimension into the other dimension of the other vector. And that gives you a much, a much richer um, measure of the similarity across all those dimensions for that specific movie. And then we rank those into a list. And we see, OK, where in that ranked list were we able to retrieve that specific test set data? So the, the way to, recall, to calculate recall is as such. Um, you simply count how many times you're able to retrieve that data for a specific range of n. So n is the number of movies you allow yourself to recommend. So usually, it could be just one if you want to recommend only one movie at a time. It could be four, five, or 10, depending on your application. But it's, usually, it's not a big number. And so you count how many times you retrieve that movie divided by the total amount of data in your data set. And you repeat that for different values of n. Precision is, is similar in a way that you take recall and you normalize that by that range value you have, n. And that normalizes your value by saying, how precise, how consistent are you at recalling a great movie, a highly relevant item, as we, we decrease the space of the recommendation? So here are some of the results we have. Uh, this is a graph of record n. On the left, we've got uh, the record percentage. And at the bottom, we have rank n, which is that, um, that, that uh, list we allow ourselves uh, for the recommendation. So we've got two lines. We've got, in blue, the log likelihood ratio. So that's a simple recommender system that only is based on that uh, normalized 
likelihood of co-occurrence between two items. And in green, we have that like-to-vex uh, algorithm that uses that embedding space to make the recommendation. So what's striking about it is that we do have a crossover at one point, but we need to remind ourselves that the task of a recommender is to perform as well as possible for a short number of n, and that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for an algorithm that is optimized for only uh, um, predicting the best movies as early as possible in the recommendation. And it doesn't matter if it recommends a movie down the line. We want it to recommend a good movie right at the beginning. And that's exactly what we're seeing right here. The, the behavior of like to vec is that even, at, uh, uh, if, even if you can only recommend one movie, then you're already getting twice the recall percentage uh, compared to the log likelihood ratio. So this graph is very similar. Um, instead of having the recall percentage, we're having the recall frequency, which is the number of hits we're able to get uh, for that specific number of n. And what you're looking for is you want a line that is as close as possible to the y-axis. And that means that you're able to recall a lot of very relevant movies and great movies for, for a small number of n. And so we can see here that like to is able to get more than twice the number of great movies for that for short number of n compared to the log likelihood ratio. Okay, this graph may be a bit confusing at first, but we, what we have here is we have precision on the left and then we have recall percentage on the right. And we have again that crossover that's happening here. But what's important to note is that although the log likelihood ratio seems to perform better at at the bottom right, it's actually um, a region of the recommender that will not be used in practice. Because that basically means that at such low precision, you're basically telling the user, among a few hundred movies, I'm 90% sure that there's at least one movie that's great. Right? But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to recommend a movie given a very small list. And that's where like to vet is performing well. It's achieving high percentage, high uh, precision scores while maintaining a good recall percentage. Um, so here I'm going to talk briefly of scores we get using RMSC uh, of predicted ratings. Um, I did say that RMSC is a bad metric for evaluating uh, uh, recommend the system, but nonetheless, like to vet performs relatively well even with that uh, metric. So here we're looking at a recommender without embeddings. So using a one-dimensional symmetric measure using like to vet ratio. And we're calculating the prediction using the top K most similar movies seen by that user. And we see an interesting uh, behavior where as you increase K, you actually get a decrease in performance when you just take a naive average of the closest movies. And it's only when you take a weighted average of that movie that you get a nicer behavior and you get a convergence of your, of your results. We like to vec. Um, it's, it looks quite different. So there's three things that we need to notice about this. Um, first of all, the error is much smaller compared to the other one. Secondly, as you increase K, you're actually getting significant improvement in the prediction error. And then regardless of having the, a naive average of weighted average, you actually get very similar score. And that comes from the fact that we're calculating similarity not based on one dimension, but based on that projection across all the dimension in that hyperspace given those uh, highly rich embedded vectors. So this, this is basically some of the preliminary results we have right now. Uh, we're working on a lot of other things and uh, we hope that we will show, show that later. I think we just have uh, two more slides left and uh, Mike Tammy is gonna take over and finish up. All right, thank you, Marvin. So, um, so as Marvin mentioned, there, there are a couple of directions that we are taking this uh, going forward. Um, one of the ones that, that uh, really stands out and that anyone who's worked in the, uh, in the recommender space probably has run into this is there is a lot of motivation for not just figuring out what, um, what somebody would want to purchase also, what somebody would want to watch also, what item a user would want to also get, but also time ordering. So understanding the order in which, uh, you know, um, get it, you know, watching this movie and then watching that movie versus the other way around or purchasing uh, Apple and then banana versus banana then Apple. Um, so in order to capture some of those 
asymmetric relationships that sometimes happen uh, where, you know, if you think about the way that the deep walk algorithm actually works, there's nothing intrinsic about um, the, the weighting from one way, direction to the other um, being the same. So it doesn't, in other words, need to be a symmetric graph in that sense from items to items or from users to users. It could be an asymmetric graph. And so um, we are working on some research search for generating, uh, generate, generating recommendations, generating results when you look at that asymmetry to try and get time, um, time correction. Something else that is, uh, is interesting is remember that there are, um, when we went to the Wirtevec case, we had directions in the, in the actual geometry of the embedded space. So there was a, say, femininity direction uh, or a masculinity direction, a, a class stature or wealth direction. Um, there is very likely going to be similar structure to the geometry of the embedding in the, um, in the like to vec space. And so taking advantage of that, looking at, um, at subspaces or hyperspaces where we can actually, um, actually uh, give context to the kind of recommendations we want to do, um, subselecting for time, for instance. Uh, all of that is very rich way that we can start leveraging this, uh, this like to vec compression. All right, so let's uh, wrap up here with the conclusions. No, you know, uh, starting with there, there are powerful parallels in text and preference data. Uh, it's very powerful with data sparsity management, um, the, uh, taking advantage of the linear structure, which seems to exist both for item user and for text. Uh, and this goes back to, uh, in the text case, uh, back to distributional structure theory. Um, for word embeddings, um, we have taken some of the, uh, the huge advances that we've seen with word to vec and similar neural word embeddings and applied that to the user item representation um, options, our opportunities, in particular recommenders. And so uh, we, have represent, or we have presented the like to vec algorithm and some results, and our initial results that we're getting with the like to vec algorithm, and how that measures up to traditional methods of doing recommenders, which is very promising. So thank you very much. And uh, this is the team. Uh, you know, again, uh, uh, Marvin Burton and uh, David Oat are, have been able to join, join us. Uh, but we also have uh, Mike Ulin, who is also, and Adam Gibson, who are also part of this uh, this project, so thank you very much.